One of the things I was also really, really keen to ask you was about the, 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 what's happened in the world over the last two years. One of the shifts we've seen in the business world is this move to remote working. And I hate it. And I hate it for a variety of reasons because I feel like there's very few institutions in, in, our, in my life where I have a chance to meaningfully connect with with people. Dating has become screens, socializing has become screens, and the office, the institution of the office in my life was one of the places, especially as a younger man, where I got to meet pretty much 90% of my current best friends and also partners. And, and I really worry about um, sitting behind a, a Zoom uh, doing my work um, for, for, the re- for the next 10 years. What is your take on remote working? Well, I like it and I don't like it. I I think it's very difficult for us to understand our embodied environments well enough to duplicate them in a healthy and comprehensive manner in the virtual world because we just don't understand what it is that we're doing when we actually do things rather than represent them. So, for example, I've thought a lot about online university. Okay, so then you could imagine... Well, you can certainly imagine online lecture courses... Uh, And you could say, well, the fact that they can be delivered on a large scale very inexpensively is a virtue. You can bring the knowledge to a very large number of people at a low cost, so why not do that? And so that's half the university. And then you could say, well, imagine that you generated the system of universal tests, which is possibility, and that means you could bring accreditation to everyone at a low cost as well. And that's that. The university's online. But that presumes that you know what the university is and you don't because well here's some other things the university is an excuse for young a credible excuse that's socially sanctioned for young people who have not yet established a career goal to adopt an identity of upward striving for four years away from their parents while they meet a new group of friends like that might be 90 percent of the university for all we know because it's certainly, the, for me, for example, when I went to college, I, I left home when I was 17, and I left a sm- this small town I had grown up in, and in many ways, I left the peers that I had been associating with. Now, a couple of them came to college with me, so I had a toehold there, but I made an entirely different group of friends, and they were friends whose goals were quite radically different from the friends that I, let's say, in some sense, left behind. Well... The reformulation of my peer network might have been the most important part of of the first part of my education. Now, I was fortunate at this place. It was called Grand Prairie College. I had seven professors, seven, which is really good, who really loved to teach. And so I also learned a lot in the formal sense. But while I was doing that, I was also negotiating, well, how much partying do you actually do? Because zero isn't the right amount. But every goddamn night till three in the morning isn't the right amount either because you have to balance that in some sense with practicality and upward striving. And so, and and how do I live with other people, my roommates? So I had one roommate who's a really good friend of mine still and he walked a thousand miles with me this year when I was ill, literally. So um, I really liked living with him because he was a tough guy, worked in lead smelters and he was a cowboy and he was a tough guy, four years older than me, about three years older than me. He'd come back to school after bouncing around through these like tough working class occupations. And he had his feet on the ground in lots of ways. And I really liked him as a roommate because I'd buy some groceries and then he'd buy some groceries or I'd make dinner and he'd make breakfast. And none of that was ever explicitly negotiated. He was just very aware of this reciprocal, it's reciprocal altruism technically. He was very good at, we were both good at tracking our mutual obligations and fulfilling them. So we had a very peaceful relationship. I lived with him for a year and, and then a little bit in different at different times and in different places. And I, I learned to live with a whole variety of roommates. I had many roommates. Uh, we had a kind of a frat house in the first college I went to, and I think anywhere from six to 20 people lived there depending on the week, you know. It was really, it was ridiculous. It was way too much fun, and that was also a problem. But when I look back on that 
time in my life. I certainly can't reduce the educational experience to virtual classes and virtual tests. That's maybe that's 10% of it. And we don't know how to replicate those environments that are so formative, especially in, in their everydayness, you know, because you live with your roommates. That's a 24 hour thing. And so the problem with virtualization is that we don't understand our environments well enough to be certain that we're not excluding something vital when we concentrate only on what we think conceptually is important. Now, I meet with my son pretty regularly for a project we're working on, which is an app that will teach people to write while well, they write and use it. So we're quite excited about this. But I meet with him virtually once a week. And it's actually very efficient. He's on the screen. We can see our project in front of us. We can do mutual editing of some of the, of the uh, underlying material, educational material. There's a real place for it. And I have a cottage up north in Toronto where we've set up a studio. But I can have an interview and discussion with anyone anywhere in the world, even in a foreign language. And that's like unbelievably remarkable. But, but that doesn't mean that we know how to virtualize reality or that we should flee into it, right? And these new technologies, they're unbelievably radical and they're very hard to master. And so we all have to be careful and try to keep our feet on the ground to some degree when we're using them. So for example, now, I've really only figured this out in the last three months. I get up and I, I do a series of exercises that my wife taught me that are based in the Kundalini Yoga tradition. That's real helpful. Flexibility and breathing exercises. That reduces my anxiety during the day, I would say about 25%. And then I try to reserve some time either for writing or I'm working on a number of artistic projects. And so I'm going to do one or, or those for a couple hours in the morning and then maybe a walk or something with my wife and breakfast. I have breakfast during all this. And then I can turn to the sort of connected world, email and the podcasts and so forth. And so there's this balance between privacy, introverted privacy, let's say, and disconnect from everyone except for my wife and then a uh, contemplated reconnection with the virtual world. That seems to be working out pretty well. And you want to get a balance of that that's actually, to use a terrible cliche, sustainable, right? So you want to hit your projects hard, but you have to leave in that, not with entertainment, but with culture, because those are not the same thing. Um, entertainment is an approximation to culture. And you need to leave in that with culture, that's beauty and drama and art and all of that. And then with intimate relationships and friendships and, well, it's very difficult to get the balance of all that correct. And it's very difficult to do that virtually. So, but I certainly wouldn't forego the technology and neither would the rest of us. It's like people complain about their phones, but they carry them with them everywhere they go. And I'm not cynical about that. The phone, it's not a phone. God only knows what it is but it's definitely not a phone. And so it's not surprising that since it just appeared and it's so insanely powerful that we don't know what to do with it and that might even wreck everything. Like God only knows, Twitter itself could bring civilization to a halt. We, we don't know how to manage the unintended consequences of our technological prowess. <laughs>